Well, good evening, everybody. Um, this is I'm Barbara Jirovich Arias, and I am happy to present this um, this subject that I'm very passionate about. So thank you, Linda, for the opportunity to sort of bring these two passions of mine together and present them here, which are depth psychology, holotropic breathwork, slash holotropic breathwork, and um, astrology. It's been, for the last couple of years, it has been my intention to, to unite both of them and bring the astrology aspect as a integrated tool when we do these types of sessions or work with clients. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, Stan Groff's cartography of the psyche. So first of all, I learned about Stan Groff by studying Jung. And I learned about astrology, it was directed to astrology, uh, also by studying Jung. So I guess Jung, in a way, introduced me to a lot of different disciplines. <clears throat> Stan Groff is a contemporary psychiatrist. He was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia, at the time, in the 30s. He was born with no religious upbringing, so he immediately went into a very Western materialistic mindset, he wanted to study animated film, but then he came in contact with a book by Freud and the analytical theory, and he became completely enamored by that and decided to go to medical school and specialize in psychiatry. He was a young psychiatrist in Prague when um, the pharmaceutical scientist sent him and other psychiatrists a sample of a newly found substance called LSD. He was working on a psychiatric ward with psychotic patients and patients with severe mental illness. And the pharmaceutical was, there was a twofold. There was, they wanted him to try the substance to sort of understand the psychotic patients a bit more, a bit what it is that, that is happening in the context of this episodes, and they also wanted to see if this had any kind of application in the treatment. So he went ahead and did that and experienced a tremendous transformation. From then on, his entire life was dedicated to working with LSD research on patients, psychiatric patients first, and then people from the population that did not present the severe mental illness. He continued to experiment with that himself, and he spent many, many years doing research on himself, patients, and people, up to the point where I think he lived, actually, he did live through the Second War, survived that, nothing happened. He was able to stay in Prague, but it was during the communist um, occupation that he had to run away. He had to run away because of the con controversial material that he was uh, studying, exposing, so he basically took a portfolio with all of his notes and uh, ran away to the US where he started to continue this work at uh, John Hopkins Hospital University and on the East Coast. Uh, then the 60s came along and uh, the psychedelic usage proliferated throughout the entire US and the world uh, in such a way that the government shut everything down, shut down all the programs, all the research programs with psychedelics that they were doing. So um, he refused to, to stop doing this work. By then, he had already developed the cartography of the psyche, which is what we're going to be talking about later. And um, he was getting in contact with astrology through Richard Tarnas. And he's, um, they were both teaching together in the Esling Institute in California. And uh, so he started to travel the world that in, in touch with indigenous communities, doing all kinds of plant medicine, just really doing a lot of research, and also realized that a lot of these communities have breathwork in order to, to get to this kind of like um, non-ordinary states of consciousness. So he crafted, him and his wife crafted holotropic breathwork. And I'm going to, actually, I think I'm getting ahead of myself and I'm going to change the slide. Um, so kind of to trace back here where I say is pioneer on the research with psychotic, psychoactive substances and psychiatry and psychology, and then develop other techniques to access non-ordinary states of consciousness without having to ingest anything once the government shut it down. 
and this is how he developed holotropic breath work. Holotropic here, he coined that word using or putting together two Greek words, holo, holos, and tropic. And what that means is um, holos is wholeness and tropic moving towards as that there is a centering, organizing, healing aspect within everybody's psyche that if we access and we work with, leads us towards wholeness and healing. And it is during these sessions that we can actually access and activate this the most. So through this LSD research um, and then holotropic research, he discovered that, or he realizes that, and also with the experiences that he's having himself by going through them, that there are three different ex areas of explorations that we go into when we go into this holotropic state. We're just gonna use the word holotropic here to define all of them that are non-ordinary. Holotropic is where I am right now. I'm here being external, giving this presentation to all of you, uh, very linear, analytical, analytical, very conscious of my surroundings. Holotropic would be in a non-ordinary or altered state of consciousness. So you're gonna just keep that in mind. And there are three areas of exploration that we tend to kind of visit, not one by one, they all overlap. Sometimes they're like divided, but there's, there's a tendency for overlapping of most of them. One is the biographical layer, which includes everything that's happened to us since we, we were born. Um, that can include traumatic experiences in childhood, um, soiling our bed, um, toilet training, anything that is biographical in nature. Uh, the transpersonal layer would be, and I'm going to skip the perinatal for a reason, the transpersonal layer is encompasses that layer beyond the personal. That would be any contact with archetypal material, other lifetimes, the divine, uh, beyond the ego, the connection or the identification with animals, uh, nature, plant, plant life. And then there is the perinatal. And this is very um, particular to him. Groff discovers this. And so the perinatal, he realizes that a lot of his patients, participants, we're going to call them from now, from now on, tend to have a certain cluster of experiences around the birth process that not only combine obstet obstetric memories, meaning the memory of um, the birthing itself, like the nurses, forceps if they were used, the anesthetics, being in the womb and hearing your mother's um, heart, uh, heart, heartbeat, but there were also archetypal memories that, and an archetype here tends to have a sort of similar essence across cultures. So there were memories that in some sense, every person shared, regardless of gender, culture, societal upbringing, religious conditioning, it didn't really matter. So he coined this the perinatal matrix. And here, uh, and he develops this as a theory, which is the cartography of the psyche which I believe that once, maybe not in his lifetime, is beginning to, to be more accepted within the academia, but I think later, as it usually happens, will become part of uh, analytical theory, psychological theory. And here are the four basic perinatal matrices or clusters of experiences that participants um, tend to go through. And we have four that, um, First one would be the amniotic universe, and he called them BPM, basic perinatal matrices. The second one would be the cosmic oppression. The third, the struggle, death, and rebirth. And the fourth, the experience, death, and rebirth. As I said before, he was Western mind oriented, so he didn't really know astrology or had been in touch with astrology but he left the East Coast, went to Esling Institute where he taught for a long, long time. And there he got in also um, in contact with all kinds of um, mystics, scholars of all types and Richard Tarnas was one of them. I don't know if you're familiar with his very famous book, Cosmos and Psyche, but it's definitely a must read for 
any astrologer, I, I believe, is kind of that um, um, main book, your encyclopedia, if you will, on astrology and the Western mind. So he meets Rich, Richard Tarnas there and they start having conversations about astrology. So they both decide to collaborate, become interested in each other's endeavors and decide to collaborate together. So what they do is that as they go through their own processes and also uh, observe the processes of participants uh, during holotropic sessions, they begin to see that there is a correlation between this matrix and an archetypal uh, or, an, or a planetary archetype, that each one of them seems to have an essence that matches one of the, one of the planets the transpersonal planets and Saturn in this case. And um, that this stage is also formed the basis for the universal spiritual pattern or monomyth found in the hero's journey of Joseph Campbell. If you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, uh, that's also a mass read, um, the hero of a thousand faces, that um, it is kind of the story of each one of us. As, as we are born and as we go through life, um, facing, facing everything that we face and hopefully becoming um, victorious at the end. Next slide. So let's dive into the perinatal matrix. So the first one, he named the amniotic universe and Neptune. So this one correlates to Neptune. And this one is the first one, the fetus is still in the womb, one with mother. And the main characteristics or emotions and essences that people connect with here are those of serenity, union, bliss, uh, uh, union with the great mother, god of goddess, um, different goddess, goddesses of different religions and different deities. And this is really regardless of the person's um, religious orientation. Um, tranquility, they experience a lack of boundary, an oceanic identification with aquatic animals, beings. There seems to be a, a sense of meaning and connection and a sense of paradise, images of paradise, of heaven. And so when patients or participants, and I keep saying patients, participants are having um, DPM1 for a Neptunian experience that is positive, um, there seems to be very connected. There's a meaningfulness to life. Life is pregnant with meaning. There is this all encompassing loving other, in this case, as mother. So when we have a good experience in this DPM1, we tend to be spiritual, spiritually open in life. There is an openness, a sort of like trusting, faith, openness in relationships. We're able to trust others. There's a sense of belonging as well. Now, there are times too, because it is proven now that the baby or the fetus becomes in touch with whatever the mother is feeling or experiencing. I think it's three seconds after this actually happens for the mother. And as we all know, life is not just perfect. So mothers go through things. Uh, so when that happens, when the mother is either going through the loss of a loved one, a traumatic experience or sexual abuse, emotional abuse, a broken marriage, then there is a different experience. And let me backtrack. This image, and I'm gonna take this away. So this is, um, before we go into where I was going to get into, this is, um, this is from Stan Groff. He, he did this. The other one was too. He was quite the artist as well. And this is from an LSD session um, where he, he was having a transit of Neptune trying his natal Pluto. So transits are going to become very key when we do sessions because they tend to activate certain BPN material. Like if you're having a Neptune transit that he was having to his Pluto, so it's sort of like soul unconscious, 
he is in a trend in a try and it's a well, slow a positive aspect he's having this kind of experience where he's one with the universe with the cosmos so i think that's very interesting to uh, to use the astrology when we do sessions before the session and after the session to kind of integrate or contextualize the material that emerged so going to what i was getting to before <clears throat> and i got a bit ahead of myself it's a toxic or hostile womb and this is when the mother it's either like i put here it's taking substances alcohol drug abuse emotional disturbances even when there when there is an an our age incompatibility incompatibility the fetus in this case um feels attacked it's a hostile uh, environment this can be the source of paranoia, psychotic distortions, even hypochondria. Chronic fears of rejection uh, seem to be deeply rooted in a toxic or hostile womb, since it is that kind of paradise that where everything is taken care, care of for us. We're being nourished through the umbilical cord. Our waste is being taken away. All of our needs are met, but and when this becomes toxic, then there is rejection from the get-go and the individual may have a lot of work to do resolving this <clears throat> negative neptune if you will neptunian experience and this is <clears throat> a drawing for from a participant uh undergoing a psychedelic session and it was taken from brent butler's oh goddess book i do not have the name of the participant it was not published but I did have permission to, to use it. <clears throat> so as we go into the second uh, BPM, BPM2, BPM2 is the onset of labor. So here, uh, graph called this cosmic engulfment and no exit and correlated it to set. So contractions begin while the cervix is not yet open. So the fetus begins to feel enormous pressure. Um, there is almost like a descent into a whirlpool of maelstrom. The all-encompassing, loving other, loving mother turns into a hostile mother, into an attacking mother. This is at the root of all kinds of feelings of antagonist, an antagonism or hostility, hostility to others. There is a sense of contraction, division, um, helplessness, hopelessness, stuckness. I mean, there's no way the organism can get out yet. And this can go on for hours. And if you can just think of an organism that doesn't have the capacity to, to talk, to speak, to formulate any thoughts, no concept of time and space, this may feel like an eternity for, for us when we're in there. <clears throat> This is where we get the concept or a contact with separation, with boundaries. Um, here is where we identify with the victim as there is nothing the organism can really do. It's just being compressed. And every time the uterus contracts, uh, the flow of oxygen cuts off as it compresses the umbilical cord. So we fall, we fall from paradise. This is sort of the eternal hole of Saturn. Um, sessions where Saturn is experienced in this way, um, from my own personal experience, I can tell you that they can be extremely difficult. <laughs> um, the, good, the good side of all of this, though, is that all of this content within our psyche, as um, Jung and Graf talked about, have a finite content. It's not endless. So as we work through it, we release it, we resolve it, and we get a chance to not act this out out in the world. Because all of this content is within us. Some were pushed into the, into the unconscious. It is also at the cellular level, it is stored in our bodies. Um, let's move on. Um, so this is uh, this would be the same concept in the picture and the drawing. This is a painting by Stangroff. This is a psychedelic session that he underwent with Saturn opposite his natal sun. As you can see, Saturn transits can bring about a lot of BPN2 material 
uh, for the participants. It probably does help to know in advance, especially for the facilitators, um, as they can provide <clears throat> presence, body work, and really help to the person to go through that and feel sometimes as stuck as you can, because only by really moving through that, that you exhaust it and come the other side. So here the mother turns into the great goddess mother, all benevolent into a devouring mother, a hostile mother, that in a way is threatening our own existence or life. So unresolved BPM2 material are the roots to depression, to a sense of failure, hopelessness, and helplessness later, on, later in life. This is why it's a good reason to explore this and exhaust them and resolve them. Now, positive saddle lessons teach us endurance, patience, resilience, and the ability to overcome difficulty. Because if we are all here and I'm here talking and you're here listening, you've gone through this and you've come the other end. So this is also imprinted in your psyche that if you endure, if you're patient, you will overcome it. You will overcome the Saturnian contraction. Other things that Saturn uh, in this experience of BPM, BPM2 teaches us is the tempering of other archetypes, the tempering of an excessive Jupiter, excessive optimism, and exaggerated um, naivety, if you will. And it brings maturity. So Saturn is all about bad. This experience, we have it for a reason. It's part of the journey. And now we go to BPM3. This is death and rebirth struggle. This is Pluto. And since we are at the Evolutionary School of Astrology, um, this one is a very interesting one. I will say that it is this archetype that we struggle with the most in our culture, in our, West, in our Western culture. We do not have a lot of access to this in a conscious way. Uh, we tend to really project this one out out of ourselves and act it out in the world. So this, uh, this, um, this BPM or this phase of the birth process begins when the cervix opens and now the baby's going through the birth canal. Now um, there is a confrontation with suffering, aging and dying at this stage. There are powerful, aggressive feelings. This, this is an active, um, stage of birth for the fetus. The fetus is now an active participant. It's pushing, it's, it's moving through it. It's not just the Saturnian stuckness, hopelessness. I'm being compressed by all sides. I'm not getting a break and there's nothing I can do. Here I am, I'm doing it. And there is like a surge of titanic forces that are all around the fetus, pushing, pressing, pressing it, but the fetus is also doing it. So now there is an identification with victim and perpetrator all at the same time. Uh, according to Groff and his theory, this is our first encounter with sexual energy. Um, there is uh, a lot of suffocation that happens during, during this part of the birth. Um, and his theory is that this can lead to the connection of sexuality with aggression. Um, that can lead to S and M, uh, sadomasochistic um, act, acting out of sexuality, and all of the stuff we see on the news, and all of the things we see about sexual um, deviations, misconduct. Um, the birth is a very sexual experience for both mother and child, and this gets imprinted in the child's um, psyche. This is the encounter with demonic archetypes or wrathful deities, as they, the Buddhists called it. There's also an encounter with um, our own frailty and fragility as, as an organism. Um, there, is, there can be nausea, disgust, as we encounter scat scatological material. This is where the fetus can encounter urine, blood, mucus, all kinds of fluids. So the scatological really comes comes up. I mean, all of this is very, very platonic, if you think about it. Uh, the imagery can be that of attacks, wars, planetary scale destruction, demonic. Uh, and there's a connection with power. This is where 
This is the first time the organism becomes in touch with the inner power to survive this, to push through this. Very important aspect of, um, of Neptune. And I picked this, of Neptune, of Pluto, sorry. And I picked this um, art by uh, Giger Esk. Uh, he's the one that designed Alien in the Alien movie. And uh, I mean, it doesn't get more Plutonic than this. So here, scatological material, cities in decay, sewage, dumping, obsession or repulsion towards scatological material. This is where we get, uh, this is very plutonic as well. The, both um, the contact with the scat scatological material can lead to either uh, or a more neutral uh, positioning as well. Not everybody becomes um, uh, extremely positioned in one way or another or, or pathological, if you will. I mean, but there is an aspect to the psychology that has a sort of repulsion or more of an obsession with scatological material. And then we have the more extreme cases where we have people completely obsessed and they practice sexuality with this or complete repulsion of that. There is an, like I said before, identification with the victim, perpetrator. And here also we can be a detached observer. There is a threefold in the, in the Pluto or Plutonic experience or PPM3. Um, very, very intense emotions, imagery of being both victim perpetrator, but we begin to detach and see it from above too as a whole picture. Now, as we, as we transition uh, from BPM3 into the fourth, the very, very dark plutonic landscape of Giger esque in the previous picture begins to turn a little more comic, like in this carnival picture. Uh, cartoonish tone, images of carnivals where now symbols of death don't appear so frightening. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And this, this art is also by Stan Groff. The fetus approaching birth is being pulled to upwards towards transcendence and the divine heart. The transition into BPM four. So as individuals transition into the last stage of birth, there is a sense of impending liberation. Moving towards purifying fires, which Stan Graf called pyrocatharsis. Identification with birth, rebirth deities, such as Kali, Osiris, Pele, Inanna, Quetzalcoatl, the promise of liberation comes. This art is, uh, art is by Becca Tarnas. This is uh, Richard Tarnas's daughter if you're familiar with her. And this was one of uh, one session that she had during a transit of Pluto conjunct her natal sun. So you can see, and, that, and then she wrote this, to live one must die, right next to it. So as you can see, there is, um, there is a dying, the fetus is dying, and, it's, uh, and the, individual, the individual baby is being born. So BPM4, rebirth and individuation. Um, here they notice that this last stage correlates to Uranus. This is when we get to the crowning, birth and rebirth. So the sense of total annihilation of previous stages culminates, leading into visions of white light, sometimes blinding lights, golden light, giant halls or cathedrals, radiant colors, end of war and suffering, discovery of benefit for all of you. Humanity. So we, here we connect to liberation, to forgiveness, redemption, salvation. And as we connect with this, there is a sense of triumph in the psyche. And this sense of triumph gives us trust. And now we want to liberate the entirety of humanity. This is what Graf uh, noticed as well, that this is where we get in touch with feelings and ideas and emotions to liberate the whole of humanity, to bring something good to all of us. So there's a spiritual reconnection, redemption, forgiveness, the awakening of intrinsic human values. This is what he realized. So as the psyche, as, the, as we go through all of this in the psyche and we connect to the last stage. And just remember, this doesn't always happen linearly, kind of like overlap. Sometimes in a session, we're more in touch with one of them or the other, 
sometimes all of them happen. But when we're connected to this very last stage, there is that sense of triumph, triumph that we carry to overcome life's issues. And here, uh, the baby is born, it's out, the umbilical cord gets cut, and the individual journey begins. So now we begin our journey as a separated being. We're not completely separated in our consciousness yet. For a while, we're gonna be still very identified with mother, but little by little, we begin to differentiate. But as an organism, we're definitely separate. So Groff observed that these experiences of psychological death and rebirth resulted in a level of healing and renewal that the psychiatric and psychoanalytic model could only dream of before. As opposed to the aims of most psychological schools, which seek to adjust us to unhealthy societies, these experiences of death and rebirth, the alpha and the omega of the human existence, without which any therapeutic system remains incomplete. So he also realized that healing tends to occur in this regress state that we that we get to uh, during sessions. So we go back, kind of ego falls, the resistance, the, the, the defenses of the ego side of us kind of fall to the side and we regress to the state. We're living all of this. And, and this is a very somatic experience for those of you that have not tried it. It's, you can feel it in your body. It's visual, it's auditory. Um, depending on which of the of the BPMs you're kind of working through the most, like a plutonic, there can be a lot of explosive uh, discharges in the body where you need to sort of release a lot of release that tends to want to happen. Because remember, all of these memories are stored <clears throat> in our cells. Um, so when we do this, when we are regressed, and we are in a good set and setting, well-contained, and with professional facilitators, people that know how to hold space and, and take you down these journeys, this is where we heal. This is where we're able now to go into all of these aspects of our psyche that in a way have been completely pushed away, um, repressed, not dealt with, and now we can recover them and bring all that life force to our lives. And when we don't do that, um, this is just beginning to become um, uh, more popular now again with the whole psychedelic renaissance and all of the things. But when we don't do that, so my hope is that we are all going to start doing a lot more of this. When we don't do that, you can kind of see how we, we just act it out. We act it all out in the world. Um, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. This is something that C.G. Jung said. Um, so the astrology to me is extremely interesting in the sense that it can help, especially new people that are just beginning to do sessions. It's really good to check transits if they are trying to pick um, a good day for a session. That is something that Rem Butler, my uh, archetypal astrology teacher, has taught me. And uh, he's also a holotropic breathwork facilitator. Um, you can actually tag your transits and pick certain days that are going to be more conducive. Um, let's just say we have a Jupiter, a Jupiter Neptune transit. That may lead to, that's actually a very good transit. You know, you just, part of that Neptunian material with that optimism of Jupiter and, and that life force of Jupiter. And there are others that you may want to avoid or that you may actually want to really go in. So that's very important for people that are just beginning to do sessions, uh, especially it's not really good that your first session is so is traumatic or very difficult because chances are you're never going to come back. Um, and uh, I, I'm also using it to integrate. So the person comes out of a session and it can feel that you just went through some epic, epic story back in there. 
so much happen, impending doom, complete doom, triumph, recovery, death, rebirth. I, I mean, a lot happens. And um, I like to use the astrology to kind of contextualize and use it together in a session because it helps really ground the experience, frame it, and then the person can really begin to like bring it home and use it. So this is where I think there is a good overlap between this, this disciplines and obviously uh, Stan Groff thought about that too and, and Richard Turnus. So I think, let me see. The last thing I put here was that Sigmund Freud developed the theory of the unconscious during a Pluto-Uranus transit. <clears throat> That is, this is something else you can actually start observing in society and world events. So there is a Pluto-Uranus transit and the unconscious becomes conscious for, for the collective, if you will. So Pluto-Uranus, there is um, the Dionys Dionysian, the recovery of these Plutonic subjective layers that the Enlightenment period uh, left behind. That was not to look at, we're just gonna concentrate on the external world, um, materialism, very reductionist, just what we can touch and quantify. With that, there was an entire repression of this more plutonium, subjective, feminine, Dionysian <clears throat> impulse, impulse that's completely pushed back into the shadow. So as Pluto transit Uranus, I think they were opposite at that time there is a recovery of that. There is like a, a, like a breaking through, a revolution of the Plutonian aspect. And 2020, we just had a very crazy transit. Pluto, Saturn, if you can start thinking of what BPM material gets activated with each one of them, it becomes a really interesting uh, exercise. Um, we just had I mean, as a society, we're still kind of trying to rebirth. I mean, there is an entire death of our systems and through a lot of constriction, contraction, <clears throat> Saturn, Pluto. And when Pluto and Uranus were uh, together in the 60s, the energy was different. It was very Plutonian in the sense that there were structures that were dying and new ones that needed to come up and uh, be born just like we're having right now. But the whole energy was more Uranian. There was like a revolutionary um, sense in the collective, new ideas, uh, throwing out the old, um, revolting. And this time, 2020 has felt very Saturnian. We are here in lockdown, a lot of us still, uh, constrained in our homes, compressed. And there is a sense of lack. And there's been a lot of sense of hopelessness and helplessness during this year. And we're still kind of continuing a little bit. So you can start kind of sensing how and seeing how this also gets expressed through world transit and the collective. And how we as a collective also act these things out all together um, in wars, aggression towards others, um, this whole BPM3 material usually comes out as finding a common enemy out there that we need to destroy, when in reality, all these things are in here. And my hope is that, well, you found this interesting and that maybe it will spark more curiosity and, yeah, curiosity uh, to to undertake this amazing journey that we've already taken because we're all here. And this is, um, these are the references that I used. I just wanted to post them there. Um, different books, if you're interested. Oh Goddess by William Butler. This is on Archetypal Astrology. The Way of the Psychonaut by Stanislav Graf. Beyond the Brain by Graf. Cosmos and Psyche that I already mentioned. And this is a really good documentary, The Way of the Psychonaut. Um, it was released in 2020 by Susan Hess Logase. I'm not sure how you say her name. 
And uh, I believe it is on Amazon Prime. And um, yeah, I highly recommend that if you're interested. Okay. Well, I think that concludes my presentation. And if there aren't any questions, I will close. Okay, Barbara. Thank you so much. This was an absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating topic. Just a, a wonderful, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. I, sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. No, no, just, just, just fantastic. I loved it. So thank you so much. And we're looking forward to catching you next time. Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess I realized I didn't uh, give you my website or anything else here. Um, well, so it'll yeah, be if you're interested, underneath it'll be posted. Me. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Barbara, All thank right. you so much and um, we'll catch you yeah. next time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Bye.